Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for the video cast. This is lesson 8.2. Uh, we're looking primarily at the effects of the trans regional trade networks that develop in Afro Eurasia up until the period of about 1450. And if you recall what I suggested at the end of the last video, the, the four separate networks that we had looked at previously by 1450 essentially become linked up to form one giant Afro-Eurasian network. Now, uh, just a quick review about why that happens. The, the Kickstarter is in the classical empire and the three main causes for the development of uh, the emergence of trans-regional trade uh, increased demand, especially for luxury goods, increased security, especially by military force, and increased revenues through taxes and tariffs. So that's sort of driving uh, the, the expansion of these networks. You'll recall that the four networks you need to know generally know who was trading, what they were trading, where they were going, and how but also when they uh, sort of hit their peaks and then slowly declined. But what we're focusing on in this video are the effects because much more than goods are exchanged, although goods are exchanged to be sure. Uh, one thing I wanna note is the difference between migration and diffusion is a big issue here because while we tend to think of uh, things moving because people move, that's not exactly how it happens. That in point of fact is the purpose of the uh, simulation that we'll be doing in class later this week. Uh, so the way we're gonna do this is by looking at different themes and how they are affected uh, by these trans-regional trades, beginning first with culture and of course religion. You may recall this image that you had seen uh, previously, but now let's think back on this and how this relates to the uh, the trade routes that we've been focusing on. For example, Hinduism, the earliest one of these, the only ethnic religion, um, you may recall that it spreads into Southeast Asia because of migration. And the reason for that is because this is the very beginning of the development of Indian Ocean trade and that area of Southeast Asia becomes a crucial part of that. The next religion though is Buddhism. And you'll notice Buddhism is plugging into the very beginning of the Silk Roads. It's using that as a conduit, if you will, for its diffusion. Uh, in the case of Christianity, it's the Mediterranean trade routes. Once it spreads west uh, and, and particularly with uh, St. Paul, it's plugging into that network and spreading throughout the Mediterranean and all the way into Russia. And then finally, uh, Dar al-Islam, the post-classical period, if you recall, uh, this is the last of the universal religions, but by that time, we've got the Trans-Saharan trade. We've got the Indian Ocean Network very well developed. We've got uh, the Silk Roads and the Mediterranean. So the, the point here is Dar al-Islam benefits uh, because of the previous establishment of these trade routes, that's one of the reasons that explains why it was able to grow so quickly um, and, and spread over such a large portion of the earth. The next thing we're looking at is economics and particularly the use of currency, beginning with coins. In the classical period, uh, the idea of using coins uh, spread primarily through trade routes, although the trade routes were not so trans-regional. But one thing to notice about this is the, uh, the use of using uh, precious metals like silver and gold in particular and stamping them with an image of your leader as a way to make a coin. Interestingly, in the case of the uh, Chinese dynasties, particularly the Qin, uh, and to some degree the Han, they didn't do that. They made their coins out of, uh, out of bronze and they were cast. And so they weren't round at all. They were all these very unusual shapes. They were one of the first people that had bronze cans uh, casting technology. Nonetheless, uh, you'll recall that the idea of flying money, of, of printing money on paper uh, begins with the Song Dynasty and then when the Wan dynasty, the Mongols take over China, they simply continue this policy. Well, 
during the time of Pax Mongolica, their control of, of such a large part of Afro-Eurasia, I'm sorry, of Eurasia, spreads that idea of using paper uh, as currency, what we call cash. This particular image is a woodblock printing of a uh, bill. I'm not sure what the value of it is uh, during the Yuan Dynasty. And then later on, we get this idea of credit. Banking houses that are using writs of exchange or bills of exchange, which are essentially an early form of check, if you think about it. Um, but this was an idea that appeared both uh, in China and in Europe. Uh, and again, the, the Mongol Empire was sort of this conduit uh, to spread this. All of this had the effect, though, of increasing uh, the volume of trade uh, throughout particularly Eurasia, but eventually even into Africa as well. Uh, the next theme we're looking at is technology. And we're going to look at several different types of technologies here on your sheet, you'll notice. The first one is printing. And the idea of printing actually begins with the uh, making of textiles, of cloth for clothing, in this image, uh, you can see a South Asian woman who is printing. You notice that block she's got there. Carved on that are certain images. And if you notice on the, on the cloth that she is printing on, there's different reliefs for different colors. And you simply add on more and more and more. Uh, cotton textiles from India had always been a big thing partly because of the quality of the cotton, we'll get into that in a, more, in a moment, but also because of the designs through this printing. That eventually diffuses from India into China, but the twist in China is that they make those wood blocks characters for writing. And if you look at this image on the left, you can see the blocks have the characters uh, that are carved in relief, but you may also notice that they're squares. And there's different characters on different sides. This is called movable type. You can actually pick up uh, the, the, the cube, if you will, and, and move to a different character, rearrange them to produce a text, which is what you see here on the right. That technology, though, is then diffused across the Silk Roads by the Mongols until it eventually gets to Europe. Now, the, we'll get into this more in the next unit, but you know the idea that Europe invented the printing press is really not quite entirely accurate. If you look at the image here, what Europe added was this little mechanism here, this screw that tightly places the, the, um, the carving uh, onto the paper. Uh, they also, instead of using wood, would eventually use iron to do that. But in many respects, that's really kind of a, a refining of a previously existing technology that originally came from China, uh, before that from India, and then is diffused by the Mongols. So another technology we want to look at here are weapons technology, and specifically in this case, gunpowder. Gunpowder, you might recall, was uh, invented in China. It was originally <laughs> as part of a Taoist alchemical kind of pursuit, some way to find the secret to everlasting life, and somebody realized that you can use this to blow, uh, blow things up. And uh, this early image in the Song Dynasty in, in particular, it was primarily like what we would call a giant bottle rocket. They just sort of shoot that at their enemy. But that was the first use of gunpowder as a, as a weapon. In this image, what we see is a very early form of cannon. Uh, this was developed in the Middle East. Um, and if you notice, it's not on wheels or anything like we think of it. It's just a giant, um, almost like a vase that's shooting out a ball. But nonetheless, that has the impact, this, this metal ball here of, of blowing up uh, anything that it hits which turns out to be particularly good for city walls in the case of the Mongols who use this as part of their siege warfare technique when they're trying to encircle a city and just not let anything in or out and batter them until they collapse. So that technology then, again through the Mongols, is diffused into Europe 
And then we start to see in Eastern Europe and parts of the Middle East, the Mongols developing these sorts of cannons that have wheels so that they can be carted around much more easily from city to city as part of their siege warfare. The real twist, though, for the Europeans is starting to shrink down the cannon, so to speak. This is a very early type of weapon. I frankly don't recall what the, the technical term of it is. But what you see is it's starting to look more like a gun, even though it's still essentially a cannon. It's got this long pole. You need the fire right here. The ball is getting smaller. This, again, is something we'll get into later on. To what extent did the, did the Europeans really invent anything uh, in terms of gunpowder technology, even though they benefit from it greatly in the next time period. So another uh, technological impact has to do with travel. Also, there's a little bit of this that involves military technology as well. And the first type of travel I want to focus on is overland travel, because uh, these are things that you might not think are such a big deal. For example, the idea of a bit and bridle, the bit is the part that's in the horse's mouth and the bridle is this part right here that you use to control the horse. Um, the, the, the evolving technology was perfected in Central Asia and again with the Mongols then spreads throughout. This allows much greater control of the horse by the rider. Again, that's not just for travel purposes, although it definitely is, but also for military purposes. Similarly, the saddle and stirrup, the saddle, the, the thing you sit in, and the stirrup that's used to control the horse even more, originated in Central Asia and then diffuses in all directions outward during the Mongol Empire. The overall effect of this, though, is increased travel, not just on horseback, but also on camel, because these exact same technologies can be modified for travel by camel, again, having the, uh, it, the effect of increasing uh, longer distance trade. In addition to that, though, we have maritime technologies, maritime meaning ocean going. So among those, uh, we've got this uh, We've got this instrument called an astrolabe, which uh, comes from the Arabs originally, and its purpose is to find your position relative to a star. So it's an incredible technique uh, for increasing accuracy for navigation. In addition to that, the uh, Arabs also developed a ship technology. Uh, this type of ship is called a dhow. It's a relatively small ship, but it's highly maneuverable, and the key has to do with its sail. You'll notice this sail is like a triangle. It's a lateen sail, and the main benefit of the lateen sail is that you can switch its position and do what's called tacking against the wind. Essentially, what you're doing is flip-flopping and going in a zigzag direction using the lateen sail to drive you forward even though you're going into the wind. This has a huge impact in Indian Ocean trade because if you recall the way travel had been done in the Indian Ocean, you had to wait six months before the winds reversed to take you back home. Even though the, the cargo was not huge, uh, that technology of the Dow with the lateen sail to tack against the wind becomes a real uh, significant has a significant impact in the Indian Ocean trade. Uh, in the case of China, one of their uh, innovations is the compass. This is the earliest compass. You put some water on this spoon here. Uh, the compass, of course, we think of it as it tells you true north. It's interesting to point out that it tells you south as well. And for the Chinese, they oriented their uh, directions and their maps towards south, which they put on the top of their map. Uh, for many, many years. That's obviously a huge navigational uh, innovation that's going to make a difference, but so too with their ship design. This is a ship called a junk, and we'll get more into the technology of the junk later on, but the key idea is this. They are huge cargo vessels. They can carry far more cargo than anything anybody had ever seen. Moreover, if you look in the, this is the, the uh, back of the boat, uh, the stern, 
This thing down here is known as a stern post rudder. The, the, there's a post that comes up here that the, the pilot can actually use to help steer the boat in addition to the sails. So again, that has an overall effect of not just increasing uh, the ability to control the ship, but because of its design, it's so big, it increases the ability to carry cargo over greater distances. Okay, uh, next, the, the theme is agriculture, which you may recall is not really a theme. This is kind of tricky because it's, a, it's an issue that appears in several different themes. It's part economic because it's food production. Uh, it's part uh, environmental because it does involve bi biological uh, beings, plants and animals moving. Uh, and it also involves a little bit of the uh, technology because uh, infrastructure, for example, involves exactly that. One of those irrigation techniques, though, early on that spreads is something called the Kanat system. And there's some dispute about where this started. Some say that it was in Egypt and uh, Africa, uh, North Africa. Others say that it was actually probably in South Asia. It's hard to say, but what we know for sure is this is a way of drilling wells down to a water source, particularly in arid areas. And then you dig a horizontal line and then channel all that water. Instead of just drawing water out of the individual wells, you channel it down to where it is that you want it to go ultimately anyways, using this as a way for irrigation. The key uh, idea here, though, is it was the Persians who helped diffuse this particular technology. It worked great in really dry areas because if you think about it, so little of the water is actually exposed to that hot air, much less likely to evaporate over time. Very effective for irrigating uh, land in particularly dry, arid conditions. Another uh, innovation, this definitely comes from South Asia, but is spread throughout Dar al-Islam, uh, is the Noria, which is a water wheel. And the way this works is, if you notice, the stream has a current and it's sort of catching the water, then dumping it in this trough, and then you just literally d uh, guide the trough to wherever it is, uh, whichever row of whatever field it is that you want the water to go to. Uh, rather than digging a whole irrigation ditch, this makes it a whole lot easier. A similar technology, also from South Asia, Sakya. This is a similar design except for you're pulling water up out of a well as opposed to using a stream. It's hard to see here, but you can see this donkey that is turning this wheel. And right here on the center post is a giant corkscrew. And by turning that wheel, the corkscrew is turning and it's basically sucking the water up. Then you dump it into a trowel and then you redesign or uh, you, you point that to wherever it is that you want the field to get water. Again, both of these originated from South Asia, but when uh, Dar al-Islam is spreading, particularly uh, through the, the Indian Ocean trade, this is a technology that spreads uh, pretty much from West Africa all the way to Southeast Asia. Now, in addition to uh, the way that you irrigate your crops, there's the crops themselves. And several different crops moving I want to focus on. There's a whole lot that we could do. Uh, but one of the earliest ones that a lot of people don't think about are bananas. Bananas originate in Southeast Asia. And it was Malaysian sailors who figured out a way, and we'll get more into this in the next unit, figured out a way to bypass the monsoon winds by going south of them. And it put them on a straight line uh, towards Africa. And instead of going all the way to Africa, though, they go to Madagascar, the island off of the coast of Africa, and end up settling there, and they bring bananas with them. From Madagascar, then, bananas will diffuse all throughout Africa. And in fact, uh, to this day, Africa and particularly South America are sort of associated with ban bananas. All of them, though, originated from those sailors moving across the Indian Ocean 
Um, another one that you may recall earlier was Champa rice. Champa rice originated in Southeast Asia. Uh, it diffuses northward into China as China is expanding its trade, trying to get into the Indian Ocean via Southeast Asia. They're exposed to this. Uh, that crop will eventually lead to a huge population explosion in East Asia. Um, and then another one a lot of people don't think of is citrus fruits. Citrus fruits originate in the area that includes Persia and India. Uh, and they are diffused all throughout Dar al-Islam. But then especially from the contact through the Crusades primarily, they will then diffuse into Southern Europe. So places like Italy and Spain in particular become very well known for their growing citrus crops. Again, spreading through Dar al-Islam, the contact with the Crusades into Europe originally from Persia and Southeast Asia. Now, these are all food crops, uh, crops that are grown primarily for food. But there's another type of crop that even though it could be consumed is not considered a food crop. For example, sugar. Sugar originated in South Asia, in India, and the plant can grow other places, but it was the Indians who realized how to refine it into what we know of as sugar. That by, boi by taking the juice of the plant, boiling it down, evaporating all of the water until all you're left with are the crystals. Now, we'll get much more into sugar because it turns out sugar drives a whole lot of global trade in the next time period. So we'll get back to this more later on. The point I want to make now, though, is twofold. One, everybody loves sugar. And when the Muslims are exposed to sugar as they are moving into South Asia, that quickly spreads throughout Dar al-Islam along with the technology for refining it. The key, though, is they're having a hard time finding places where it will actually grow. There's some islands in the Mediterranean, a few places in North Africa where the sugar cane will actually grow, but they're constantly on the lookout for places where it can grow. Nonetheless, it diffuses and eventually gets into Europe where Europeans, as everybody, sugar is highly addictive, uh, will just go crazy for the sugar. The second point is this, yes, it's consumable, that is, we, we eat it, sort of. It's considered, though, a luxury good. It's, it's a cash crop. Its value is much more than uh, calories for sustaining life. It's not needed. Uh, you don't need sugar to live, unlike maybe salt. And so it's what's known as a cash crop because you grow it primarily for the profit of selling it as opposed to sustaining life. Similarly, we have the cotton plant. Although that is not consumed, it is nonetheless a plant. Uh, again, in, this originated in South Asia along with the technology for how to weave it into threads and then uh, how to spin it into threads and then how to weave those into cloth. It is worth pointing out ancient Egypt also had a way to do this, although uh, it kind of de declines because of the value of the cotton cloth from South Asia. We'll get back into that in the second semester, though, as one man tries to reverse that. The idea, though, is this. That plant does spread to other areas, but rather like sugarcane, uh, in Dar al-Islam, there's a hard time finding places where it will actually grow very well. And so it always uh, stays sort of a luxury good uh, simply because it's hard to grow even though it does diffuse in other areas. And finally, we have the silkworm. And you might be going, well, wait a minute, that's not really a crop, that's an animal. And you're right, an insect is an animal. China was the only people in the world for a long, 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 long time who knew how to make silk. There's a story about how the, uh, the technology for silk making spread to the Byzantine Empire that I might get into later on. The key is this, though, what nobody realized. The silkworm needs a particular type of mulberry plant on which to live. And so the spreading of, of the technology to make silk depends on a crop 
a type of mulberry tree, which that's the only thing that the the uh, silk can be produced by the silkworms. Nobody knew that until very recently uh, in our study of world history. And so these are, again, all cash crops down here on the lower end. They're, they're grown primarily to make a product that's going to be of super high value as opposed to food crops, which are uh, more sustainable types of, of, of uh, products that you need in order to just live. And then finally, we have the environment, which uh, again, disease is a component of the environment. Uh, and the two big incidences uh, involve the classical empires. If you recall, there is a plague that spreads across the Silk Roads uh, that affects both uh, the Han Chinese over here and Rome uh, later on. We call it a plague. In fact, it was probably a mix of several different types of, of uh, diseases, including smallpox uh, and influenza, among others. But what you can see is both of them, uh, both Rome and the Han Dynasty, are dramatically affected. These charts, this is in no, millions of people in the Roman Empire, millions of people in the Han Dynasty, and you can see the, the impact. One of the things to note is it appears the impact hits the Han before it starts to affect the uh, Romans so dramatically. But of course, the big incident everybody remembers is the bubonic plague, which again is spreading primarily through the Silk Roads. This time though, during the Pax Mongolica, um, our best estimate now, although this is changing quite a bit, I will point out that the, the particular um, strain that we call the Black Death began in, in this part. It's right. It's Bangladesh now. It's in between South Asia, Southeast Asia, moves into China. All that trade over the Silk Roads during the Pax Mongolica ends up spreading it into Europe, parts of the Middle East. Uh, where it's going to have, obviously, devastating effects there. Now, my premise, again, is by 1450, what starts off maybe as four different uh, separate trade networks are all sort of overlapping. And um, the, the, the spread of goods is obviously a big part of that, but I hope what you've gotten from today's lesson as well is it's much more... Uh, that is diffused than just um, goods. I want to thank you for your attention, and I appreciate you. I'll see you in class. Thanks.